I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, as the Ukrainian winter bites, we discuss the most recent Russian strikes across the country that have killed civilians and left whole regions without power. We also analyse Putin's turn to the Arctic, new revelations from former PM Boris Johnson, and the detail of the most recent British military aid offering to Ukraine. Just a note to our listeners, as we were recording, Russian strikes on the entire country were ongoing, so you'll hear updates through the programme as we get them. And our guest, Alina, is calling live from Kyiv. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 23rd of November, day 273. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Assistant Foreign Editor Venetia Rainey, Assistant Comment Editor Francis Dunley, and our guest today is the Managing Editor of Ukrainska Pravda, Alina Polyakova, who called us live from Kyiv as the Russian strikes in her city continued. I started by asking Venetia for the latest news from Ukraine. I think the biggest story that we've been leading with this morning is the strike on a maternity hospital. Um, That happened this morning. Several people have been pulled out, a mother and a doctor, but the mother was there with her two-day-old baby son and he didn't make it out alive. We've had attacks on maternity hospitals before, most notably in Mariupol, and they don't get any nicer to report on. Um, this is part of sort of ongoing Russian bombardment across the country. We're seeing you know, freezing temperatures. Russia's trying to eliminate energy facilities. Vladimir Zelensky came out with his usual sort of you know, very punchy language. The enemy has once again decided to achieve with terror and murder what it wasn't able to, able to achieve for nine months and won't be able to achieve. Um, It's just a miserable story and we've been watching, seeing lots of footage of people being pulled out from the rubble in this um, town of Kupiansk. Thanks, Venetia. Dom, do you want to come in on this? Uh, Yes, I will. Thanks, David. I would uh, just want to jump on the back of that because of, uh, I just want to make mention of today's UK Defence Intelligence report. Um, It's talking mainly about drones. It's saying since September, Russia has likely launched hundreds of Iranian manufactured drones. We know these Shahid-136 drones that we've seen um, being fired against Ukraine. Um, MEDC say these have been a mixture of what they call one-way attack drones, which is, as as our colleague, friend and colleague Roland points out, is is a really clunky form of language, one-way attack. Many people call them kamikaze drones. Other people dislike that phraseology, but it feels that if you call them one-way attack drones, you then have to explain what you're talking about. But anyway, DI Defence Intelligence talking about these drones that Iran is supplying to Russia and saying they've been mainly targeted against the electricity grid to make up for the uh, severe shortage of Russia's, Russia's cruise missiles. Although it does note that none of these drones have been launched since uh, since the 17th of November. However, they then make this, this really interesting comment, uh, and, it, and I'll quote it directly. It says, Quote, however, recently, Russian commanders likely also wanted Iranian-sourced UAVs, sorry, that's unmanned aerial vehicles, um, Iranian-sourced UAVs, to prioritise medical facilities as targets of opportunity and strike them with guided munitions if identified, unquote. Now, I raise this because of the news this morning about the attack on the on the hospital that killed the, uh, the, the, the newborn child and continuing attacks across the country, attacks that are ongoing literally as we speak. Um, And I I thought that was incredible language there from UK Defence Intelligence saying um, Russian commanders are likely have uh, also wanted Iranian drones to prioritise medical facilities. It is a very inflammatory statement. They wouldn't have just said it um, off the back of uh, if there was nothing to to support that. They don't make such analysis just just on on a whim. Um, And I thought it was just worth mentioning what the language means because we talk about this kind of stuff a lot we do use defense intelligence a lot uh, and as we said many many times before please do also go and search your own your own avenues of uh, for, for information don't take our word for anything don't take defense intelligence word for anything you know you've got to make you've got to be a, a, an intelligent consumer of information here guys um so uh, but i do think it's worth just specifically talking about the language when they say likely or highly likely or there's a remote chance or all this kind of language from a, from an official British government source, 
it does mean something. And I just want to take just a quick 30 seconds or so to explain what this is. Now, all this comes from the British government, what they call the probability yardstick. So they, they split the uh, in terms so as to make it make it clear when they think something is going to happen or is not going to happen. And to to uh, to, to, to explain the context and narrative around these these issues and episodes. Um when they say when they think there is a remote chance of something happening, they mean there's less than five percent chance. Now, of course, all this is subjective. It all takes um, it, it, it takes a, a degree of analysis, and there's going to be there's going to be room for error. Of course, there is. But what they mean remote chance less than five percent of an event happening. Highly unlikely. If they use that language, it means between ten and twenty percent. Unlikely is twenty five to thirty percent. A realistic possibility means forty uh, or up to fifty percent. Then likely, or if they use the word probably, it means 55% to 75%. Highly likely is up to 90 and almost certain um, over 90. So again, this is, this is language. It is all it's open to interpretation. It's based on a myriad of sources, some of which are very, very opaque. So it's not going to be definite. But I just want to make it clear that when defense intelligence uses the phrase like, such as likely, they said it's likely Russian commanders want these drones to prioritize medical facilities as targets of opportunity. They are saying they are content that there's between a 55 percent and 75 percent of that statement being true, which, OK, 55 percent, 75 percent is not. It's not absolutely certain, but if I told you it, the likelihood of rain today is fifty-five percent, seventy-five percent, you'd probably put a coat on as you go, go to work. So I thought this was this was very interesting language used by British defence intelligence, not only for raising this issue as part of today's update, but also using that phrase "likely." I mean, they didn't say "unlikely," they didn't just say "remote chance," they didn't just raise it. So I don't know what the background intelligence is upon which they've based this assessment, but I thought that was very interesting. Um, very shocking, especially in light of today's episode and the ongoing strikes, as I said. But to use, use phraseology such as likely it does mean something. This is not just um, conversational language. When you interview some people, some officials, they do use, I mean, words like la- likely or probably or uh, realistic possibility. These are all very human phrases. We use them, use them a lot. But in an official government document, and a tweet is is such, then the word likely means something. I just wanted to to, to raise that uh, and just sort of take a little pause there on the back of the on uh, the back of Anisha's news. Thank you very much for that, Dom. Just before we go to Alina in Kiev, Venetia, can I come back to you? You wanted to talk about two things. Um, one in Russia, Putin uh, look, looking to the Arctic, and also this uh, this raid on the this this monastery in, in Kiev. Could you talk us through these these two stories? Yeah. So there was an interesting development in Russia yesterday. Putin sort of joined by teleconference to watch the launch of two nuclear-powered icebreakers. These are massive boats called the Yakutia and the Ural. Russia already has two icebreakers, um, but these are being launched as part of a sort of renewed drive to dominate the Arctic. You might have seen sort of bits and bobs around this before, but it is a a sort of an ongoing theme for Russia to really take control of this region that we will be hearing a lot more about in the years and decades to come. China is also making inroads there. You know, there's some talk of referring it to as the Arctic Silk Road. It's a much shorter transport route. Obviously, it goes over the sort of top of the world, um, but it's 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 hard work, and you need icebreakers to get through that ice, even though some of it is increasingly melting due to climate change. Um, Russia and China are particularly well positioned to take advantage of that. Russia, especially so, and Putin has been quite explicit about what he's up to up there. You know, he said that this is to strengthen Russia's status as a great Arctic power. He's been reopening Soviet-era naval bases on Russia's northern shores. The idea is really to dominate it. And that's both economically useful in terms of, you know, trade routes, um, exploration of natural resources there. But it also gives it more political clout, Um, you know, just like control over the Suez Canal was once a big deal for the British. Control over the Arctic for Russia is likely to be increasingly important in the years and decades to come. Um, And then, yeah, as you mentioned, another interesting story that might have flown under some people's radars was... um, Ukraine raiding a monastery in uh, in Ukraine. Um, they have been looking for a while for Russian collaborators, um, particularly we've heard a lot about that since the liberation of Kherson in recent weeks. Um, there are a lot of people who were pro-Russian in Ukraine before the Russian war. That did decrease, obviously, a lot once Russia invaded, but there were still a lot of sympathies. And that's particularly true for one particular branch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is officially allied with the Russian Orthodox Church and sits under one of their patriarchs, Kirill. Um, 
So there's been a lot of talk about divided loyalties within that church. Most officials in the church sort of broke off and said, you know, they didn't support Russia's invasion. Um, but Ukraine's raid on this church suggests that there are still people who are very sympathetic to Putin. Um, the SBU, Ukraine's secret service, said that they'd arrested um, a bunch of people for subversive activities by Russian spe special services. Um, and Russia was quick to hit back, obviously, um, you know, decried the raid as godless, wild, immoral. Um, but it just shows that there are a lot of sort of shadow wars going on uh, underneath or alongside the big sort of fighting that we hear about in Kherson and the east that are worth keeping an eye on. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Venetia. It's really good to have you back on. Uh, Alina Polyakova, thank you so much for joining us. Um, can we go to you? We know that you know we, we, the temperature is dropping in Kyiv. Blackouts are becoming increasingly more regular. Uh, and, and, you, and you've said before joining that you know you don't know necessarily how much uh, electricity um, and signal you, you'll have. So if, if you do have to drop out, please please don't worry. We, we understand. Um, do you want to talk us through a little bit about, about your day? What, what's it like uh, in Kyiv at the moment for you? Well, now, hello, everybody. Now we have an ongoing massive missile strike, numerous explosions, and uh, uh, half of Kyiv is already without electricity and without water, and other cities are also without electricity. And if we will talk about, like, everyday life, now in Ukraine you need to be a really good manager just to manage your life because uh, blackouts change daily routine a lot. Uh, before then, we needed to do all the necessary stuff, like buying groceries or collected parcels from the post office, only between the air raid sirens. And for now, we also have the schedule of electricity cuts, and we still have a daily job and uh, trying to rest somehow. And you need to manage all these on a daily basis, and it's quite hard. You, you mentioned the, the schedules for the, the electricity blackouts. Um, how reliable are, are they? You know, how, in, in your life, are, are you able to sort of set your watch to them or often do, do, do these happen without, without warning? What, what's it been like for you? Well, there are some schedules. Um, however, they do not always work because in case of PZL attack or even more extensive use of electricity uh, than expected, uh, there can be emergency blackouts and you can can't predict them and that's why people for example are scared to use elevators and um, because there is a high possibility to stuck there and uh, also people who rented flats with a view on a high floor uh, start to move away because it's hard to live without an elevator on the 20 something floor and since since the sort of the start of these huge strikes um a month ago we've um it's got a lot colder. Win winter has arrived in Ukraine. For, for those who don't know, can you sort of talk us through just how, how difficult and harsh it is no normally in a Ukrainian winter and actually what what you and, and, and your friends and your family and, and everybody in Kiev are having to do now considering these energy blackouts? Well, now we have like a zero degree um, Celsius and tonight it was like minus two, minus three and it's only the end of November. So it will be colder. It should be up to minus 10 degrees. And people are getting ready for the winter differently. Some people buy tourist equipment like sleeping bags and tents for using them in their apartments in case of electricity and heat cuts. Also, people buy sublimate fo sublimated food, thermoses and thermal underwear. And of course, the most popular items on the shopping list now are power banks portable power station, solar generators, and so on. And for, for those popular items, the power banks, the solar generators, are, are, there, are there lots of them? Can you, can you get one if you want one, or are, are they running out? What, what's the supply side of this like? Well, now you, it's very hard to find uh, power banks and solar generators in Ukraine, so we need to order them um, in the European Union or um, in the USA, and uh, we are waiting for them uh, to come to Kiev like four months or even more. Oh wow! Um, obviously, this is a, a moment in time uh, where mutual support will be uh, incredibly important. Be that between friends or neighbours or family. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What what are um, apartment blocks or groups of friends doing to to help each other? What have you seen? Well, there is very much support between people now. 
for example, if you have friends nearby and you have different schedules of cuts, you can visit each other's homes during the day to have electricity and the opportunity to work. And if you have no friends, you can just go to a cafe. In the cafe, you will have a plug-in and Wi-Fi and different stores make charging station for devices. And I really love how small businesses are preparing for blackouts because they give people opportunity to work, to continue live their life, to have electricity and internet. And I feel the atmosphere of mutual help in the air now. Can we talk a little bit about the, the atmosphere? I mean, we, we, we think obviously that Putin is doing this to try and break the will of the Ukrainian people to, to resist. And there's been much talk about how these strikes are happening because if he's losing on the battlefield, he might be able to, to, to win on the sort of you know, destroying infrastructure, making sure Ukrainians freeze. What, what's your sense of people's morale, of their, of, of, of their will? Has it had any effect? Well, I have opened Twitter to join this discussion and every tweet uh, which I see which I seen it was about that Russia you will not scare us uh, it's it's better without you than with it's better without electricity than with you so this is, winter can be hard but we will survive and uh, we are ready for everything can I just ask obviously the, your local government national government will be doing a lot to try and support people at the moment um do you have a sense of what kind of policies or, or actions they've taken? And do you think they could be doing more? What, what do, uh, what do the, the people of Kyiv and, and of Ukraine really, really need their government to be doing? Well, it's hard to criticize. I believe uh, that authorities are doing their best. Uh, emergency teams are really titans. As for me, our authorities need to work on communications better because of the different controversial claims, for example, uh, when the head of uh, DTEC, Ukraine's major energy en- energy producer, claimed that it's better for people to go abroad. And then after the panic moods on social networks, they told that uh, there was no need to panic and everything is under control. And there were such controversial claims about the evacuation of people from Kyiv in the case of total blackout. And today in the morning, uh, I, watch, I watched the interview of the mayor of Kyiv and he told in the interview with Bild that uh, it can be the worst winter since the Second World War for Kyiv. And um, they tell this to foreign media, but do not communicate with Ukrainians. And I change that firstly, because we have the right to know what the situation and what's really going on. Well, thank you so much, Alina. Um, Dom and Francis, you're listening. Um, do you have any questions for Alina? I do, if that's all right. Lovely to hear from you again. Thank you for for coming on. Um, I just wanted to ask, first of all, whether you've got a sense of how many people are actually planning to leave Kiev uh, as a response to the winter and to the latest attacks. Is there a, 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 a plans for a, a, a mass exodus in the coming weeks as it gets colder? Or do you think that actually most people who are there now are intending to stay? Uh, Well, thank you for the question. I know the cases when people left uh, because of uh, electricity cuts and in the most cases um, it's mothers with small children. Uh, But uh, the other part uh, is intending to stay and to survive this winter together in Kyiv. Thanks, Francis. Uh, Dom Nichols, anything from you? Yeah, Elena, hi, it's Dom here. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I mean, a very troubling day today. I hope uh, hope you and your loved ones are somewhere safe. I just wonder if you can give us a, a feeling for the um, for these new pieces of infrastructure that we've seen um, approaching or in Kiev and else, elsewhere in Dnipro, we've seen some of these pre-fab- precast um, concrete blocks that people can are able to get into the shelters. Have they been have they been emerging recently? Do you think people are going to use them? There have been reports. Of um of people sort of looking at them with be- bewilderment and when the air raid alarms going off just 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 carry on their daily lives. So I just wonder how you thought they would they would gel with um with Ukrainian society at the moment. Um, I'm talking about the points of invincibility that Zelensky has mentioned in yesterday. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as I know, uh, there are more than four thousand of them have been set up in Ukraine, and they will be activated in the case of prolonged power outrage. Uh, and um, it looks like one of these attacks is going 
on now and we will check it in the nearest future. And it was promised that uh, all basic services will be there, including electricity, mobile communications, internet, heat, water, and everything people need. Uh, absolutely free and 24 per 7. And I think that if the situation will go worse, then we will check how it works. Alina, can I ask, um, obviously lots of our listeners will be extremely moved and, and worried by everything you're saying about what daily life is now like for, for you and, and everybody else in Ukraine with the temperatures dropping and the strikes continuing. Um, what for, for you, what can people from abroad and from elsewhere do um, or help with? Um, is, is there anything and is there anything you, you would ask from them? To donate army for our funds like save, uh, save life, um, come back alive. Uh, or Pritula Foundation to help us uh, to win as fast as we can. Well, thank you so much, Elena. That was um, that was quite scary, really. To hear. We, we've we've obviously in, we talked when we, when I when we were in Kiev, and we've had you we've had you on before to talk to us about things. And it sounds like this is, as you said, going to be an incredibly tough winter. So you know you have all of our support, and we we hope you're okay. Um, do do stay around as, as long as you can. Um, and and of course, no absolutely no worries if you have to drop off if there's um, a, a loss of electricity or or um, or, 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 or and power or anything like that. Um, Dom and Francis, can I turn to you? There's still quite a lot to talk about today. Uh, updates from from the European Union, um, from Ukraine, and elsewhere. Um, Francis, you haven't spoken yet. Would you like to go next? Sure. Well, thank you, David. I think I will start, yes, with uh, the European Parliament. As I said yesterday, with the liberation of Herzon, there's been a renewed focus on Russian war crimes. And indeed, we've seen today that the European Parliament has declared Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism following the brutal and inhumane acts inflicted upon Ukraine and its citizens since the launch of the invasion. I'll read a quote from uh, the MEPs who have been behind this uh, symbolic resolution. And I should emphasize it is symbolic. It doesn't have a, a sort of legal foundation, but nonetheless, this is a significant moment, I think, in, in setting the tone of the discussions as we enter winter. So here's the quote. The deliberate attacks and atrocities carried out by the Russian Federation against the civilian population of Ukraine, the destruction of civilian infrastructure and other serious violations of human rights and international humanitarian law amount to acts of terror against the Ukrainian population and constitute war crimes. In the light of the above, the European Parliament recognises Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism and as a state which uses means of terrorism. So very strong language indeed. And uh, there was a vote on this in order to be passed and it passed with a large majority. I need to crunch the, the, the numbers of exactly how it was broken down and which party supported it, etc. and which countries. But broadly speaking, it was it, it was passed without much uh, um, contradiction, I think it's fair to say. Just whilst I'm on the same subject of, of atrocities, which I know has been a theme this week, just wanted to fl flag that there's been some interesting remarks by a British lawyer assisting Kiev's war crimes investigations. And and he said, and I directly quote here, that Russian generals systematically planned and ordered sexual violence. Now, this lawyer is, is working on compiling evidence against Russian commanders on behalf of the, the Kiev uh, government. It's a sort of Western-backed team providing le legal expertise. And it goes into, he goes into quite a lot of detail about, about the investigations they've been doing. And he said that in some cases, these generals have not only been uh, aware of, of atrocities that have been committed, but they have actually encouraged it and even ordered it. So, um, as I say, a very, very striking uh, intervention there. And I, as I say, I think we can expect over this winter period for there to be a renewed analysis uh, of, of what has been going on uh, as we see more of these liberated territories investigate what's been happening in the months they've been under Russian control. Thanks, Francis. Can I just stay with you for one more point? Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about Zafirisha. Um, there's been some developments uh, down south. Uh, can you talk us through them? 
Certainly, because I've talked about Zaporizhia quite a lot this week, and I think it's just important to keep returning to it given it's, because it's uh, so significant. Um, I commissioned a piece for the paper yesterday from a regular on this podcast, Hamish de Breton Gordon, formerly of NATO, of course, working in chemical and biological warfare and, and nuclear um, concerns as well. And uh, he's written a piece for us that just talks about how dangerous Zaporizhia is. You know, we've become sort of, I think, adjusted really in the West to just sort of accepting the fact that it's occasionally under attack and that there's um, all sorts of concerns concerns about it and we think it's sort of rumbling away but if something went wrong you'd very quickly know about it and of course there are all sorts of concerns about how this might be used as a weapon by the Russians to offer a reset on the battlefield and all sorts of concerns this is why I keep returning to it when even if the, the stories perhaps pale in insignific- significance to certain others that we cover but um, the latest update today is that uh, President Emmanuel Macron has held talks with his Ukrainian counterpart calling for the demilitarization of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. There's been, of course, uh, more uh, than a dozen explosions that have been reported since uh, Sunday. And uh, he's talked to uh, President Zelensky about the vulnerability of energy infrastructure amid the increasing fears that Ukrainians uh, will not have enough heating and light through the winter, but also talked just about the concerns around the the power plant and what could happen if things were to um, go south in that direction. And uh, as I say, I think it's significant that there's been it's it's been a subject of conversation at such a high level. This isn't something that's just taking place between nuclear experts in in uh, in the UN or within Ukraine, but is actually something that is being raised at the very highest levels of discussion. Now, just whilst we're talking about Zaporizhia, the UN nuclear watchdog has said that its chief has discussed safety at Ukraine's occupied plant with the Russian delegation as well in Istanbul today. So again, just speaks to the urgency of of of, of what the International Atomic Energy Agency think uh, is a really important issue and one that uh, no doubt will be a central focus for us uh, over the winter because, of course, with the energy infrastructure strikes that have been uh, a central focus now of the Russian attacks uh, for for many weeks, Zaporizhia returns as as a core focus for for their attacks and for also possible terrorist activity there. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Dom Nichols, can I come back to you? There's been an interesting story from uh, the UK about helicopters that the Ministry of Defence has announced uh, it'll, we will send to Ukraine for the first time. Why is this significant? Yeah, so this is an announcement today by the Ministry of Defence. It came out of Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary's visit to um, to Oslo. He's there at the moment. I um, I wasn't able to go for various various really important childcare reasons. Um, so I, I sort of suggested earlier in the week that this this latest military aid conference was going to be happening. And the big thing that's come out of it is that uh, Britain is going to going to supply three Sea King helicopters to Ukraine. So Sea Kings, based on the old Sikorsky, I forget the, the model number, but big uh, the the same model model that Marine One, the same model as Marine One, the, the US president's um, helicopter you see picking up from the from the uh, from the White House lawn. Um, so those those type of helicopters, um, they have been in use in very various different guises in British military service for many, many years. Um, they were uh, painted yellow and used as search and rescue. Um, in fact, also sort of grey and red and used as maritime search and rescue for the Navy for a bit, I think. They were used um, by the Royal Marines as a, as a, in, a in a combat capacity and, and in a very striking sort of black and white camouflage um, tiger stripe type type paint scheme for um, for Norway, but used for for many many years. Very capable aircraft, a whole load of different roles. Uh, went out of service in 2018, and the uh, we're told today that the Royal Navy has been providing a six week program of training in the UK for ten crews, uh, pilots, and engineers from the armed forces of Ukraine. So Ben Wallace is in is in Oslo. Uh, he went yesterday. He's coming coming back today. Uh, and he's hosting so this northern group. So this is not the um, not the uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's uh, Ramstein initiative, which is the, those big. They probably happen every month or every six weeks when there's forty or fifty nations around the table all pledging military aid. The northern group was the uh, was was Ben Wallace's uh, idea actually, and it's that smaller group. It's um, it, it's sort of European grouping. Uh, the northern group is. Basically, well, so it's UK, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Latvia, Lithuania, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Sweden. So effectively, it's JEF, the Joint Expeditionary Force members. It's all the JEF plus Germany and Poland. Interesting. So interesting that Germany and Poland are there. 
interesting that France is not, I, I think, but one for one for another day. So Ben Wallace today hosting hosting the, the Northern Group. Um, there's also uh, UK pledged an additional 10,000 artillery rounds. Um, good, but that, that'll last a couple of days. Um, I don't yet. I haven't seen any news out of there yet from other nations about what, what they are going to pledge. But it but it came from it came from that. Now this is it's a big deal. Obviously, offering airframes. Other air, uh, other countries have done similar. So the US have provided or they bought a number of Mi 17s off the open market. Um, the big the big sort of hip latest hip variant, and they've sent them out. Other other countries have, have pledged likewise. Um, so. Yeah, aircraft is is a controversial area because of the amount of time it takes to train people to operate them and more importantly to look after them. I reckon with about so it's a six week program of training for these crews that will take them up to um, a good a good standard. I mean, obviously these are these are pilots to start off with, so converting to the airframe uh, should be fairly fairly straightforward. It's a very forgiving airframe. I've never, I've never flown it. I've been in the back of many many. In fact, I've dangled out of one on a on an abseil rope. Um, in Bosnia some some years ago, but uh, again another another story. But so a very forgiving aircraft to learn to fly, to learn to maintain it. That's something else entirely. And I reckon with only six weeks, they they've basically they'll be able to do daily servicing, monthly servicing, probably the twenty five, fifty, maybe a hundred hour servicing, the big annual service. Um, and once you start getting up to your five hundred hour and your thousand hour servicing, they are they're pretty in depth. I I wouldn't have thought. That the time available to these engineers only six weeks in the UK, I wouldn't have thought they'd been able to go into that depth. So we, I, this is either a bet that the war is going to less, last less than a year, or there'll be some arrangement that that it, it, in a year's time the the airframes will come back to the UK for an, for an in depth service. But I mean, you know, that that's a long a long way down the line. I think this is pretty good news. Any any capability is good. Um, helicopters, given the given the um, the distances involved. In Ukraine and um, and the, the paucity of uh, of good landing sites now for fixed wing aviation, I think these, these are, this is a, a move in the right direction. Um, hopefully, others will follow suit, and we will uh, will keep track on that. But if this is the first of many, um, like I say, we had many many seekings in British military service across all three services. Uh, sorry, no, it wasn't in not not with the army. It wasn't in in service with the army. Um, but we have many of those uh, in storage still. So hopefully, there'll be there'll be more to come. But I'll keep tabs on that. Thanks, Tom. And just for our listeners, don't worry, we are keeping tabs on Dom's stories for another day. And at some point, maybe post post all of this, we will be trying to find out exactly why he was dangling out of the back of an aircraft on on a zip wire. Um, but thank you very much, Dom. Francis, can I come to you? The, Boris Johnson gave has given a very interesting interview. Um, th- 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 excuse me. He has thrown some light on the early stages of the in- of the full scale invasion. Could you talk us through that? What have, what have, what have we learned from his perspective? Well, yes, definitely one for future historians to to, to really find uh, inve- incredibly invaluable. Uh, so it, Boris Johnson has essentially offered an in-depth look for CNN into uh, the initial reactions from European countries to the invasion. Now, I've talked in the past about some of the Washington Post revelations about just quite how um, different countries were treating the intelligence about the possibility of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, if you recall, uh, Britain and the Baltic states were the only two countries in the in the European continent that really believed that an invasion was imminent. France was particularly dubious, as was Germany. And yet, of course, we all know what uh, what happened um, uh, back in February. So. He's offered a little bit more insights on this and has basically, in a condensed form, has accused Germany of of wanting Ukraine to quickly fold to Russia to avoid a protracted conflict. He's also accused Emmanuel Macron of failing to anticipate the invasion uh, and has also been similarly critical of Rome's early stance on Russia before talking in much more glowing terms about the response as it currently stands. But I'll just read out a few interesting interesting quotes that he offers. So first of all, when he's talking about uh, the reaction to the invasion, this thing was a huge shock. We could see the Russian battalion tactical groups amassing, but different countries had very different perspectives. The German view was at one stage that if it were going to happen, which would be a disaster, then it would be better for the whole thing to be over quickly and for Ukraine to fold. I thought that was a disastrous way of looking at it, but I can understand why they thought as they did. He goes on. 
be in no doubt that the French were in denial right up to the last moment. And then he goes into more detail about some of the conversations that he had with Macron. Then he turns to Italy, as I say, the uh, talking about Mario Draghi, the uh, Italy's former premier. At one stage, they simply were saying that they would be unable to support the position that we were taking. And he alludes to the fact that that may have been as a response to energy's, energy concerns. Of course, Italy being one of the countries that was much more reliant on Russian energy than others. Then he, he concludes by saying what happened was everybody, Germans, French, Italians, everybody, Joe Biden, saw that there was simply no option because you couldn't negotiate with this guy. Of course, he's referring to Putin there. However, the EU now has done brilliantly. After all my anxieties, I pay tribute to the way the EU has acted. They have been united. The sanctions were tough. Now, just to offer a little bit more insights on how people are reacting to this, I'll just point to you to some comments by Edward Hunter Christie, who is a former NATO official and now uh, works for a policy, uh, policy think tank. Um, and he, I think, summarizes it very well when he says that, you know, what we learn from these remarks is that several months have passed, attitudes have changed, understanding has progressed, many sanctions were passed, much military assistance has been provided. And one can say that there was significant moral and political awakening only a matter of days into the war. But it was also eminently clear that the change was shock-driven and peer pressure-driven. It was clear that Schultz and Macron had to be repeatedly pressured, corrected and dragged along. They made progress over time, but partly thanks to others. And I think that is the lead takeaway here from Boris Johnson's interpretation of events. And I should say that, of course, there'll be very different interpretations, no doubt, in other European capitals. Um, that this is an example of where it really was critical, the stances that were put forward by the Baltic states, by Ukraine, of course, and by Britain, that that laid down the marker that others could eventually follow when they saw the seriousness that had um, that the, the, the invasion uh, really was. That it, were it not for that, it would appear that there would have been a much uh, quite a, a quick crumbling of of the resistance in the international community. I'm not saying among, in Ukraine, but I'm saying amongst the international community. So I think, as I say, this is something that historians will be will be really um, fascinated by this question in 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 many years, decades, perhaps even centuries to come, um, about this question of of just how integral was the uh, united support that was offered later. What would have happened if certain uh, leaders had taken different stances earlier? Could the war have been prevented? All sorts of very significant questions. And of course, we'll get much more remarks of this nature once we have more leaders um, who were the premiers at the time of the invasion are no longer in office. Of course, that's the case for Boris Johnson, but at some point that will be the case for Olaf Scholz and for Macron. I'm sure they will also have insights that will offer perhaps a slightly different take on the events that led to the tragic invasion. Thank you very much for that, Francis. Dom, can I come to you? Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about this. It's a small story, but it's maybe maybe one to mark and and, and move on. Um, that this we're calling it in our notes, we're calling it the false flag attack in 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 Russia, and it's only based on the Institute for the Study of War, but it's potentially worth talking about. Can you can you talk us through what you're thinking? Certainly. So the Institute for the Study of War, US based think tank, that um, over the over the months have shown themselves to be. Uh, fairly uh, sensible and accurate. So they are saying today that um, they are suggesting the Kremlin is setting the information conditions, their, their phraseology, information conditions for false flag attack in Belgorod. That's one of the southern regions, southern oblast, um, sort of abutting Ukraine around the Kharkiv area, so the northeast of, of Ukraine. Um, and the Institute for the Study of War is saying that they are talking up this, this possible attack by Ukraine into Russia um, in order, in an effort to regain public support for the war. Uh, and they are hypothesizing that Ukrainian forces are going to invade near Belgorod, or you know, Belgorod the city and Belgorod the, the, the region. Um, and uh, other, other sources are helpfully, I mean, not that this was coordinated at all, I'm sure, other sources, military bloggers in Russia, are, are suggesting that, um, that Kharkiv could, should be attacked again to minimize the threat of a Ukrainian attack. Um, 
So military bloggers, have, have, they've been intensifying their calls for Russia to do something for, uh, in recent in recent weeks. We saw the, the, the mass retreat from Kharkiv and then the, the events recently in Hezon. So the military blogger community are not happy. Uh, and they're saying that only preemptive measures are going to stop Ukrainians from carrying out assault operations inside Russia. Um, and Belgorod Oblast Governor, uh, Mr. Glagkov, He's published footage showcasing the, the, the building of, of fortifications. So, I mean, they're really ramping up this idea that, that the Ukrainians are coming. Ukraine have, have never made any any claim, any desire to, to move into the territory of, of Russia. Now, there have been some mysterious explosions in oil oil facilities and um, and other military targets around Belgorod, which uh, we've all sort of said, well, that's, that's probably a Ukrainian either... Either a heli assault raid or or, or drones or uh, special forces or something. U- Ukraine have never, I never offered an opinion on that. Never, c- neither confirm nor deny. Um, but I mean, they have been clear that they have no intention whatsoever. They've got no need to go into Russian territory. So it's interesting that these that these reports are out there and the military blogger community is starting to get very energised on this front. And the ISW is suggesting that maybe. This is a way of distracting from the recent reversals on the battlefield and possibly setting up the conditions for, like I say, a false flag attack in, in Belgorod. So I'll keep, a, keep an eye on that over the next few days. Thanks, Tom. Just important to mention, obviously, we know that the, the strikes today are, are ongoing. I've just seen some news that there's no heat and no water in Jotomir and Hymnitsky. Uh, after Russian strikes. We know that several people have been killed in Kyiv. So this is all a, a situation which is unfolding. Um, Francis, can I just come to you? Um, I think there's one final story we should talk on before we um, start to wrap up and come back to Alina. Um, Francis, you've been looking at an interesting statement from the CIA. Um, can you talk us through it? Sure. Well, the CIA have uh, said officially that they are scouting for disaffected Russians. That's according to uh, its espionage chief in what of are, of course, very rare public remarks. He was talking at uh, George Mason University's Hayden Centre uh, when, and I should say that this has been reported in, in the Washington Post, uh, who obviously had some reporters there at the time. And uh, he has said, uh, and I quote, and this is in his first in-person public appearance, Putin was at his best moment the day before he invaded. He squandered every single bit of that. We are looking around the world for Russians who are as disgusted with that as we are because we're open for business. So let's say on, you could say on in many ways, well, what do you expect? This is a pretty predictable. The CIA will be looking for disaffected Russians. But to talk about this publicly, I think, is quite significant um, because it's a clear signal to disaffected Russians within Russia, within America, within uh, Europe, that, you know, that they are looking for people who are willing to work with the West in a way that will ultimately contribute to hopefully some change in Russia that can lead to the end of the war and hopefully the end of uh, Putin's regime itself. I mean, this is a a central question now is, is, is whether it would be possible for Putin to ever be uh, allowed back into the international fold. Um, My own view of course, is that there's no way that he should be, that that sounds a very, very dangerous signal indeed. Um, But of course, other countries have have different views on that. Indeed, there are concerns that a successor to Putin might be even worse, um, even more strongly nationalist, less of a uh, rational actor, if indeed that's the way of articulating it. So all sorts of questions. But I think this should be seen as, say, these remarks by the CIA uh, as um, a signal that they are very aware of of the numbers of people, of the numbers of Russians who have left, of course, hundreds of thousands, who may now be looking for uh, alternative employment and that one of the things they want to do will be able to offer offer intelligence and support to to American intelligence uh, companies. Now, I think it's worth saying as well that this was absolutely integral in the Cold War, as listeners will be aware. I mean, were it not for defectors like Oleg Gordievsky, of the, uh, who was uh, quite significant in the KGB, who was a double agent for MI6, were it not for him, invaluable intelligence during the Cold War that really changed the whole future trajectory of the conflict um, would not have been known by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Um, I'm pointing particularly to his insights around uh, Gorbachev and how significant that he might be as a future premier. And of course, Margaret Thatcher famously said that Gorbachev was the man of which we can do, we know we can do business. And part of the reason for that was the intelligence that was offered by Gordievsky. But not only that, of course, um, Gordievsky as well 
was integral in offering intelligence about what the Russian mentality was in the 1980s. And there was a huge, huge disconnect, it turned out, because of his revelations between what the West was thinking, which was thinking that, you know, Russia was sort of ramping down in some of its rhetoric, that it was looking for a, a sort of a, a way of, of reforming and adapting, when actually in the early 1980s, it was far, far more paranoia in the Soviet Union than uh, many expected and thought at the time. Um, and indeed, when there was the um, potential uh, incidents in 1983, where it was believed possible that America in, within Russia, within the intelligence services, that, that America might launch a preliminary strike before some attack um, on, on the land, just shows how much of it, how, how much the the gulf was widened um, in, in the 1980s compared to how it was in the 1990s. So absolutely valuable intelligence was offered by defectors like this. And so whilst, you know, there's a lot of glamour around the Cold War and some people have questioned the actual importance of, it, of, of, of much of the intelligence offered at the time. Anyone who reads uh, John the Carre novels will always get the sense that actually what was it all for. But actually, the historian in me would say, no, this stuff was absolutely vital. And so I think we should see the CIA's comments in that regard as equally significant. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Um, Dom and Francis, can I just have your final thoughts for today? Dom, why didn't you go first? Yeah, I'll just put a placeholder, if I may. Um, hopefully, we, our, our colleague James is going to pick this up tomorrow. But there's a CSTO meeting happening now, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, what uh, Russia would like to think is their equivalent of NATO, happening in Armenia. Um, however, there are a number of protests. There's images online, protesters, some with Ukrainian flags, are calling for Armenia to, to get out of the CSTO. Um, Putin obviously wants... CSTO be seen as a viable force, to be seen as, as having legitimacy. He needs as many friends as he can get, hasn't got many around the world. So the CSTO is, is, a, um, is a, as a plank in there. It would be a, a massive diplomatic blow um, were Armenia to, to leave. Um, also Kazakhstan, that is a member of CSTO, coming under fire. Again, the, the, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the military community, the social media community and the TV stations actually are now turning their fire onto Kazakhstan. Apparently Kazakhstan's been overrun with Nazis. I mean, these Nazis are breeding like rabbits as far as I can tell. They've overrun Ukraine. They're now in Kazakhstan. But anyway, so there, there's a lot of talk about um, trouble in the CSGO and it'll be fascinating to hear, hopefully from James tomorrow, what the, what's actually coming out of the meetings. But I'll just, um, I'll just put the placeholder there. Thank you. Francis Daly. Thanks, David. Um, obviously, listeners will be aware of what happened last Tuesday when we, of course, heard about the uh, incident in Poland when two people were killed by a stray missile. And I just wanted to cover an exclusive in the Daily Beast, which is that the Associated Press, who originally put out the story on their newswire that a senior US intelligence official had uh, reported that Russian missiles had crossed into NATO member Poland and had killed two people, that the journalist who did that has, we understand, been um, sacked by the Associated Press. Now, of course, this is a, a small story, um, but in many ways, I think it speaks to something a little bit more significant, which is that there are consequences when there is... Uh, mistakes made in Western journalism uh, there. And obviously there's been a misunderstanding here, a miscommunication in terms of uh, what was reported and looking into the details, they're saying that there was a, usually the rule is, is with the Associated Press that they have to have two major sources uh, to verify any significant information or one irrefutable source. But in this instance, clearly, if they have sacked this individual, then um, there was not the proper diligence done before it was put out on the news wires, and then newspapers around the world reported the story. But as I say, we talk a lot about misinformation on this podcast, particularly in the form of Russian pro propaganda. And of course, you, we get critics, people who say that Western journalists do the same, you know, that we offer merely a, a different narrative, um, that, that there is no objective truth, that it's just a different perspective, a different cultural angle, and that really it doesn't matter who you hear your, hear your news from. And I would just say that, you know, in, at, at the very least in Western journalism, and of course we don't get everything right, far from it, but there are certain principles, certain rules that have to be followed and abided by. There are all sorts of bodies, etc., and there are consequences. And when we compare that with what we see with Russia's propaganda, then there are no consequences. 
sense. It's the kind of misinformation that's constantly put out on social media, that's been put out in the sort of vicious um, propaganda news stories that, of course, we've reported on and and the regular show, daily um, television programs. Um, it doesn't matter what those pundits say. But ultimately, you know, they, what, what's the old maxim? Comment is free, but facts are sacred. And the facts that, that were misreported last week, there has been an, an acknowledgement of a mistake that has been made and that has now been been put right, um, I'm sure the Associated Press would argue. And I don't think we would expect to see the same in Russia. Thanks, Francis. Just before we come to Alina for the final thought, I mean, it's, I think it's worth just emphasising how fast move everything is moving um, today. Uh, we, at 116, we have an update on our website that there have been blackouts in Moldova. Uh, Russian strikes on Ukrainian infrastructure have resulted in massive blackouts in Moldova, its deputy prime minister has said, uh, and it's working, the, the state-owned electricity firm is uh, working to reconnect more than 50% of the country to the electricity. Uh, we've, we, we're seeing at 125, there's an update, uh, the Kyiv key, energy operator confirms emergency shutdowns, there's the energy operator D, DTEK said that emergency power shutdowns have been imposed in Kyiv following these strikes. They're doing everything they can to stabilise the situation as soon as it's as soon as possible. At 122, entire Kyiv region without electricity, the capital without water supply. Uh, so all of this is happening. These strikes are happening right now. Thank you so much, Alina, for joining us through this. It's um, we're, we're hugely grateful for you, and I'm sure our listeners will be grateful to hear to hear to hear you as well. Um, as our guest, would you like the very final thoughts for today? Uh, well, thank you. Um, the European Parliament recognized Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism today, and Russia have proved that it's actually a terrorist state, and they hope that it will be a proper answer, and we get more weapons. And uh, thank you guys for covering Ukra- Russia-Ukraine war so nice, because it's um, very important in fight with Russian propaganda machine. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast by The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can also listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, do leave a review as it helps others find the show. To our listeners on YouTube, for reasons beyond our control, there's sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload, so if you do want to hear an episode as soon as possible, it's available on your podcast apps. Please search for Ukraine The Latest on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your preferred app. Check out the Ukraine page on the Telegraph website. As ever, you can get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and on Twitter, Jaden Irving.